trust the scientists. Trust what the scientists are saying. That's something we've all probably been hearing recently or have at least heard before. And I want to raise a counter question and simply ask, what if we don't really understand what the scientists are saying? You see, scientists have a communication problem. Their work is specialized. So specialized, in fact, that if a layperson were to go about reading scientific reports as they come out in academic journals, the chances are they won't have a single clue what these studies are talking about. There's an immense amount of jargon and technical information tied up in graphs and data, which require advanced knowledge to fully understand. These articles are written for and by other scientists in the field. And scientists in different fields, say astrophysics or neuroscience, don't even know what the other one is really talking about either. Thus, while there is genuinely exciting research taking place in top laboratories around the country, most of it happens behind closed doors. I know this firsthand because I worked in academia, and I worked previously as a scientist. But years ago, when I was a humble teenager, before I had dreams of going about science myself or dropping whole-scale criticisms on institutions of higher learning, I was volunteering at an assisted living facility for the elderly and people with dementia, such as Alzheimer's disease. When I was in high school, we had this requirement about community service, to get out of your orbit, meet and interact with different people, and do some good. And that was cool. And as a teenager, what I really wanted to do was play music all day. So whenever the time came to do some community service, I combined passion and obligation, pick up my guitar, and drive across town and play music at an assisted living facility. Now I love old people, and already being somewhat of an old man in my teens, I enjoyed spending long hours at the nursing home, listening to their stories, looking at pictures and singing songs. And there was one sunny afternoon there where we'd been gathered around the piano when one of the patients, a woman who because of her dementia never said much to anyone, she'd smile and would talk and would mostly repeat the same sentence like clockwork. But this afternoon, after I played some songs on the piano, she said that she played piano growing up and asked if she could play a piece of music. And I said, absolutely. And she sat down and she played a beautiful piece of music far more complex than anything that I could play. But when the song was over, it was like it never happened. She was silent again. She would repeat the same sentence. The moment had passed and she had forgotten. What makes it such that someone can remember a beautiful arrangement on the piano years later, but is unable to recall the conversation or moment that happened a few minutes before? That's the question that got me interested in science. But here's the tough truth. We are all brought into science as outsiders. And as I quickly learned that passion notwithstanding, I had no idea what I was talking about. I knew nothing about anything. Even after majoring in chemistry in college and taking advanced biology classes and working in a research lab, I was stunned when it came to studying the brain. Here's a sample from a paper I was reading at the time. It's a particularly important paper published in Nature Genetics. Towards the beginning of the paper, they describe what they do. <clears throat> Under the banner of the International Genomics of Alzheimer's Project, we conducted a meta-analysis of four GWAS samples of European ancestry totaling over 17,008 cases and 37,154 controls in stage one, followed up by genotyping of 11,632 SNPs showing moderate evidence of association P less than one times 10 to the negative three in stage one in an independent sample that included 8,572 cases and 11,312 controls in stage two. Hmm. In other words, understanding the genetic basis of Alzheimer's disease was going to be way more complicated, way more difficult to manage than the feeling of inspiration that I got from a touching moment that I experienced at a nursing home. Now, people brand this inevitable lack of knowledge at the beginning of one's graduate studies as a steep learning curve. Now, despite my lack of knowledge on the topic, I knew enough to know that I wanted to learn more. And I knew that I wanted to do better to communicate my discoveries on paper in a way that everyone could understand. So I read and I studied and I worked. And years went on and, and I found myself having more experience, more familiarity and more confidence with the work I was doing in the laboratory. And after years of late nights at the microscope and long experiments at the bench, I finished and I put out my paper and I had my PhD. So I'm going to read you a line from my paper, literally the punchline, the big moment, what the research is all about. <clears throat> 
We find that dorsal root ganglion DRG axon is a creative factor supporting axon growth and identify it as the C-terminus of the ER stress-induced transcription factor CREB302, which is generated by site 2 protease cleavage and sensory neurons. Now, C-terminal CREB302 forms a complex with sonic hedgehog and stabilizes association with the patch one receptor on developing axons. Our results reveal a neuron intrinsic pathway downstream of S2P that promotes axon growth. What? No one knows what that means. Most people don't even know what these proteins are. And, and frankly, these people could be working one biological inch away from the sensory neurons that I was studying. So I didn't beat the system and I didn't change the system. My own research was dense and unreadable. And it is here that I am reminded of the first lesson that kicked off this talk. Science is hard. When I began speaking today, I started with the observation that academic papers are tough to read and that frankly, they're inaccessible for most people. And I'm telling you now, yep, that is the case. We have specialized problems and we have specialized answers and it can't all be movie magic. And I don't have the golden solution here, but I'm going to wager from my experience that one can constructively address this problem. That is, we can still improve scientific communication Maybe targeting the journals is just the wrong spot to do it. Here are some possible solutions. There could be a requirement, say by high schools, colleges, and other institutions of higher education to teach classes that show how to communicate science effectively. You could build communication into the curriculum and really ask, what did this study say to you to guide your experiments and understanding of the field? And what does it mean for an outsider? Every paper, every study, focus on the main takeaways. Do this in classes, in journal clubs, and continue doing this in academic publications. Because some academic journals have in fact developed a feature that paints what the study is about in broad brushstrokes. This puts scientists at the narrative helm of their own work. They control the story and can prevent it from being misinterpreted and misunderstood. To quote my dad, you could be the smartest person in the entire world, but if you can't get your ideas out in a way that someone else can understand or use them, then it doesn't matter what you know. You can only live in your own head. As an academic community, how do we get outside of our own heads and make sure that science gets translated effectively? I want to give two easy pointers about what people can do to communicate science more effectively. Number one, never lose sight of what you want to say. Translation from one language to another takes many forms. Let's say you take a story from ancient Rome and translate it in a way that completely misses the poetry and only captures the prose. Similarly, you could miss the mark and get so caught up in descriptions of battle scenes that you totally left out the emotional and narrative backdrop. Before you communicate science, you want to identify the translation that you are trying to make. Number two, stick to the main points. My old advisor would often point out that young trainees would give talks about their research and spend precious time poring over all the technical stuff. And by the end of the talk, they would forget to explain why they ever did what they were doing in the first place. These speakers focus so much on the how, they for completely forgot the points of the why and what the heck does this even mean? When communicating their work, especially to the public, scientists must be able to explain in a balanced way what they did, how they did it, why they did it, and what it all means. So why am I saying all of this? Because you should expect, in fact, as a member of the public, that these needs are being met by the scientists who explain things to you. You might not know or fully understand the data at the end of the day, but you can and should know what to look for when you read or hear about someone else's research. I want to talk about why this matters, why effective science communication is important. At this point, the COVID-19 pandemic has killed over 2 million people globally and continues to mutate into dangerous strains and yet there's an excellent technology that could stop this virus straight in its tracks. And we've had it for decades. And it's called a vaccine. We know this. And at this moment, across the US, people are being vaccinated with Pfizer and Moderna vaccines that could bring us out of this pandemic by neutralizing the deadly effects of the virus. But that progress has been hampered by rampant vaccine skepticism. In fact, a poll from AP News reported as recently as early February 2021 that around one in three US adults are skeptical about receiving these fully vetted vaccines. One problem was that the vaccine almost immediately became political as leading figures on both sides of the aisle took shots at whether they would take it. And numerous videos spread, 
falsely claiming that the vaccine was ineffective or harmful or would even change your DNA. The longer that time has gone on, medical centers, pharmaceutical companies, and other institutions have taken great pains to explain how the vaccine works, but the stories and skepticism have already run amok and a lot of damage has been done. This was poor scientific communication at its peak, not just by the scientists themselves, but by the journalists and politicians who capitalized on a sensational moment for their own gain. This is a failure in scientific communication. It also illustrates that if you're working on important research, how important it is to take your work into your own hands and control the narrative. Otherwise, someone else will. To close, we do have to trust one another. We do have to trust the scientist, but we also have to be vigilant because scientists are people too, and they make errors and they have motives. We have to accept the limitations of our own knowledge and leave some things in the hands of the experts, as difficult as that can be, whether it's the details of a paper about the molecular underpinnings of dementia or the release of a fully vetted vaccine. Yet at the same time, we all deserve to know what goes on behind the closed doors of a lab. Research is funded by the government, which means your taxes or your parents' taxes go towards funding research. You deserve to know what your money is going towards. I think translating science effectively is a force for unity. It brings us together. As a practice, it keeps the public abreast of how the frontiers of knowledge expand every day. As a scientist, good communication keeps you focused on the big picture. What is this really about? What are the real world implications of my work? Now, personally, I have both failed and succeeded at scientific communication, but the constant dialogue between failure and success is also what science is all about. We must embrace it, accept it, and use it to grow, to move on, to discover even better things. And then we must take care to explain in a balanced way what we did, how we did it, why we did it, and what it means. Thank you. Thank you.